my God. Oh, oh where is my mother-in-law at a moment like this? <laughs> oh, my God. Patty, thank you. That was more than, more than generous. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have heard me speak before. We'll show hands, anybody? Oh, good, a room full of virgins. This is just what I wanted. OK. So I thought we'd talk about why I started writing um, so late in life and uh, how glamorous it is to be a writer, which you know is not going to be very glamorous. Um, and I thought we'd talk about the making of a story, the making of a book. Um, I started writing in 1992. I think it was 1992. I had a whole career in the garment business. Um, I was an importer. I manufactured sweaters. And I spent a lot of time, we used to call it the Orient. OK, now it's Asia. Just to tell you how long ago it was, they changed the name of a whole place. Oh, God. Um, but anyway, so I, and then I married Peter. Peter and I are going to be married 30 years next week. The long-suffering Peter Frank. God bless his heart. Um, so yeah, he's just fabulous. Anyway, we had a child, our daughter Victoria, and I knew that I couldn't spend all this time, like four months a year, in Asia. Um, so I decided to stay home in Montclair, New Jersey. Where we lived in New York City, and then we moved to Montclair when our daughter was born, and do volunteer work in the community. So I very quickly became the head of every darn committee there was. And I sat on every board there was, and I was just like a maniac, because I'd suddenly all at once given up my career. I had a baby. I had to learn to drive again. I was living in New Jersey. God help me. I'm still there. I don't know. I can't get out of this place. Some, some people want to buy my house. I mean, you must know someone who wants to live in New Jersey, right? Um, so anyway, then my mother um, got sick and died very suddenly. She had melanoma. So this is my pitch for melanoma. Please, everybody, go to the dermatologist once a year and get a full body check, because um, it's just a stupid way to die. And uh, I was so stunned by the loss of my mother. I mean, any of you who've ever buried your parents, you know it's like the worst day of your life when you bury your mother. Uh, and so we have a house on Sullivan's Island outside of Charleston um, where I grew up and where she grew up and where her mother grew up. And it had been in our family for so long. And my brothers and my sister wanted to sell the house to settle the estate. So I said to Peter Frank, <laughs> this is not nice, I said, um, I need you to buy me mama's house, you know? It was right after Hurricane Hugo, and the, believe it or not, you know, beach houses were cheap. <laughs> not anymore. Anyway, so he said very, something like this. He said, if you think I'm going to spend the rest of my life sitting on the front porch with all your crazy relatives, waiting for them to get drunk and tell the same stories over and over and over again. <laughs> so we had a fight about the size of Russia, OK? Because I said, you know, I never asked you for anything. What are you laughing about? <laughs> oh, God. So it was Christmas. My mother passed away in October, and it was like December 1st or something. And I was mailing some packages out, and I ran out of uh, wrapping paper. So I had to, this is kind of a long route way to tell you this story, but it just, just goes to show you the hand of God stuff. Um, I was walking through Kmart. I just grabbed a bunch of rolls of paper. <coughs> and they had a table of marked down books. We call them remainders now. Now I know all the words, right? We learn everything. Um, I shouldn't say the name of this author. Y'all keep a secret? Anybody here related to Daniel Steele? <coughs> so I picked up this novel, Five Days in Paris. And I said, it was on the New York Times list for like 20 weeks. And I said, what's she got? You know, what does she have that I don't have? I could sell a book, buy my mother's house back. And I didn't need to make a fortune. I just needed enough to pay for this house at this depressed price and buy out my siblings and um, you know, to pay the taxes and the insurance. And I figured somehow, and to get us back and forth from New Jersey to Sullivan's Island a few times a year with our children. Um, so I figured maybe I needed thirty-five dollars or $50,000 a year, which is not a terrible amount of money to try to go out and earn because I had had a career. You know, I know how to make money. Um, not anymore. Publishing, let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, oh, that's another story. But anyway, so I sat down. I came home, and I said to Peter, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to sell a million copies, and I'm going to buy Mama's house back, and you can't come in. 
And <laughs> I swear. So it took two years because I didn't know how to write a book. So I went to Barnes and Noble and wherever, you know, booksellers. And every time I found a book on how to write the blockbuster novel or whatever, I bought that book and I read that book. And I think the most useful book I read, just in case somebody's going to ask me this later, is, was Stephen King's book called On Writing. It's just fabulous. Um, if anybody out there wants, if anybody out there is losing their mind and they think they want to write a book because it's a good idea, I'm just going to tell you now. Anyway, um, so that's it. So I sat down and I wrote Sullivan's Island. Um, and I sold it in 10 days in an auction. And um, it came out, as you said, on the New York Times list at number nine right away. And uh, <clears throat> I, you know, it, I sold over a million and a half copies of this book. And it's in all these foreign languages. And I'm kind of like one of those Oprah, your best life now stories, you know. So that's, that's how that happened. Um, and then the next thing I knew, I had a career. And you know, I've got a, an older sister. Any of y'all have older sisters? OK, so you know what they're like, right? So. <laughs> So my, I have the most wonderful sister in the world, but she really is. She's 12 years older than me. And every now and then I say, well, actually, she's 15 years. Now she's 20 years. <laughs> anyway, she, she lives in Edisto Beach, South Carolina. And she talks like this because she's been living in little tiny towns all over South Carolina all her life. So she called me up and she said, um, I, read, I read your book. I said, well, thanks. What would you think? And she said, you're going to write another book. And I said, yeah, I just got a contract for two more books. She goes, I just want you to remember something. And I said, what? She said, I have to live here. <laughs> I, said, I said, OK. She did. I swear, she really said And now I say, Lynn, don't you remember when you said She said, I never said that. Lynn, believe me, you said that. You said, my brother said, oh my god, I made these notes this morning to tell you. These are terrible stories. My brother, who has like 19 master's degrees and speaks all these languages and whatever, he told me I wasn't qualified to write a book. The nuns at Bishop Bingham High School in Charleston when I, in the 60s told me that I'd better learn to type because I certainly was not college material. Good thing I learned to type, though. I mean, let me tell you, that's coming in handy. Word processing, you know, same deal. My brother Billy, who is, God bless, God rest his soul, um, he used to go into Barnes & Noble in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, and say, I'm, I'm Dottie's brother. I need to use her discount. Lying. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> My mother in law calls me up after she read Folly Beach, I think, and she said, I really, she's 93, God bless her, you know. Um, she used to make her own soap. That's another book. I'll get to that. She's got to die first, and then I'll write that book. Don't ask. Um, anyway, she called me up and she said, You know, I read Folly Beach and I really liked it. And I said, Well, thanks, Mom, because let me tell you, there are not a lot of compliments coming from this woman, all right? So, so she said, um, you must do an awful lot of research. I said, yes, yes, ma'am, I, I did a lot of research for that book. And she said, well, I knew you must have, because you couldn't possibly know all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you stories like this all morning. I mean, how much time do we have? Oh, my god. This is my worst book signing story. Barnes and Noble and Buckhead, my second book, was called Plantation. It was a big book. It did really well. And I think that that's probably the universal favorite um, of all my books. But anyway, oh my god, this is such a terrible story. So I go to Barnes and Noble, and the skies open up. It's like the summer. And you know how it rains down here, right? I mean, it's like jungle rain. It's end of the world rain. It's apocalypsing outside, right? So I go there, and it's apocalypsing outside. And, um, I go up to the manager, I go, hi, I'm Dottie Frank. I'm here for the book signing for Plantation. And she goes, what? I said, I'm here for my book signing tonight. She goes, oh, honey, we didn't even know you were coming. <laughs> I said, this is not even my worst story. I've got a worse one than this. But, so I said, all right, well, how many books do you have in the stock? She said, I don't even know if we've got any. So <laughs> they pick up, she picks up four or five. We find four or five copies of it, a few copies of the Sullivan's Island. And I go to this thing called the Author Pit. You have no idea. So it's aptly named. So I, I'm standing there, and, and she makes an announcement. And two very old, I mean decrepit old, people came and sat down. And I said, OK, so this is it. I've got two people. All right, so I'll be a sport, you know, and I'll just do my little spiel and sign some books, and we'll be on, be on my way. And um, so I do my whole spiel on plantation and this whole story of how I started writing. And they're sitting there very polite, very interested. And at the end, 
um, I said, well, um, can I sign a book for y'all? And they said, oh no, we're just here for the air conditioning. <laughs> it's a true story. And then I said, well, can I give you a book? And they said, oh no, thank you. We're moving and we're already packed. <laughs> they said, that's, that's terrible. So here's the, here's the really terrible one. No, it's, this is, it gets worse. So I go to Dallas for some reason. I have no idea because Texas to me, I think we should get it to Mexico, but that's just me. <laughs> I have, uh, whatever. My, bro, my sweet brother lives there, my brother Michael. Anyway, so I'm, I'm at this store in some mall, some little bookstore, some chain branch, I don't, I don't even remember what it was, and there's no one there except the manager. So this is what you say when you're an author and you want to know what the hell is going on. You say, well, can I just ask you, um, has there been any interest in this event? That's the polite way of saying, where is everybody? So she said, no. I said, no. She said, I said, then what am I doing here? She said, you know, your publicist just said, do you want to have Dottie Frank in your store? And I said, yes. I, I flew the whole way here from New York to, for this. I mean, I, so my brothers called me and said, how's it going? I said, not so great. He said, well, I'll tell you what, buy 20 books and bring them home and I'll sell them to people. I said, okay. I mean, that was the worst. That was zero. I thought, well, okay, here's zero people at a signing. It doesn't get any worse than that, I, unless you start with one and they get up and leave when you're in the middle. <laughs> I guess that would be worse. Then there's the airplane story. This is the last story I'm going to tell you, then we're going to get serious a little bit. Um, and my friend, I, uh, I'm just loathe to call him my friend, Pat Conroy. <laughs> <laughs> this big, blustering old bear he is. It's actually his wife who we love, right? We love Sandra, yeah, Cassandra King is his wife. She's a wonderful writer, too. And she has a book coming out in July. All of us have books this year. Mary Alice has a book. Mary Alice Monroe. <clears throat> when is her book? July also. We're just plugging our friends here. Take up a little air time with that. But anyway, um, so Pat calls me up and he says, you're famous now. This is how he talks. You're famous now. Have you ever heard him speak? That's how he sounds, right? Yeah, what are you going to say? No, I mean, I'm standing here. So he says, he says, you don't understand. One of these days, you're going to go somewhere, and you're going to be recognized in public. I said, Pat, that's never going to happen. I look more like Nora Roberts than she does well, in the old days. But anyway, he said, no, no. Just last week, I was in the Piggly Wiggly, and this man came up. The Piggly Wiggly, this is what he's telling me. This man came up to me, and he said, I want to kiss the ring of the, the great Santini. And he dropped to his knees, and I said, please, sir, get up, get up. Anyway. <laughs> He's so crazy. So I was walking through the Newark airport going to Maine to pick my children up from camp. Any of y'all ever send your kids to camp in Maine? It's just, it's wonderful, you know. Basically the drill was I'd, I'd go up there, I'd get my son first, and I'd check into a hotel and give him a bath, and then we'd check out. <laughs> I'd open... <laughs> I'd open that big old duffel bag, you know, the big old duffel, and everything's in there nice and neat, just like it was when I sent them off. <laughs> if the child didn't grow, I could just send the same bag back every year, you know. Anyway, so I was on my way to go get him in this little plane. You know, they have those planes, propeller planes, right? I, I hate those things. They make me so nervous. I'm, I'm nervous to fly anyway, so, but... Those are really, I mean, I have to, like, take something. I don't know. I don't take anything. But if I did, I, if I had something, I would take it. But, so I'm walking through, and I see Plantation has just come out. It's there. It's blue. You'll notice that almost all my books are blue. We don't know why, but they are. Um, it's not for the Blessed Mother. I think it's for the sand and the sea and the sky, right? And um, so this book looks really good. There's a whole big, they call them dumps. It's an unfortunate term. But they call them. <laughs> cardboard stands right out in front of one of the booksellers in Newark Airport. And I'm like, God, this is just, it's so, and I said, you know, I'm really doing this. I'm, I'm really a writer now. This is my second book. I just turned in my third. I had a contract for three more books. This is, this is great, you know? So, um, so I go and get on the plane and the flight attendant looks at me. She goes like this. I can walk in and sit down. She goes, oh, hello. And I was like, 
this is very cool. I've just been recognized in public. Okay. Like, no one ever recognized me. I thought, this is it. This is how full of yourself you get and, like, how long it takes to get over it. Um, she, she just listened to this. She comes back two minutes later, and she goes, Mrs. Frank, and I'm looking for the pen because I'm going to sign something for her, right? She goes, would you mind moving to the back of the plane for weight distribution? <laughs> I kid you not. How y'all doing up there? <laughs>